Higurashi Go keeps on rolling, and Shaggy is here to talk all about it. This time it's episode 3, also known as Onidamashi Hen, or Demon Deceiving Chapter, Part 3. Like I said in my previous videos, I will be avoiding information from the previous Higurashi series and acting as if you, the viewer, have not ever watched, or read, or played anything in the Higurashi no Naku Koroni series before. So if you haven't had time to watch the 2006 anime, or have never played the visual novels, do not worry. I won't be bringing up anything that might ruin your enjoyment at watching this currently airing show. But I will mention that this episode really isn't much different from something we saw in a previous series. It seems that Go really wants to blur the lines between remake and reboot. It's fascinating, honestly. During episode 2, it seemed like new fans were being left out, like it was catering to returning fans. But with this episode, it's the opposite. New viewers are the ones that get the most from it. Anyways, let's forget about the past and hop into the latest goings on in Hinamizawa. Picking up from the end of episode 2, we see Rika performing her dance at the cotton drifting festival, including using her ceremonial farm hoe to plow actual cotton. Keiichi stares on in amazement at this very young girl doing something so earnestly, and so proficiently. She doesn't make any mistakes. She must have practiced a lot. The opening interrupts Rika vigorously bashing that cotton, but after it's over, we see the villagers showing Rika some much deserved love. Mion grabs Sadako again and they hightail it out of there, giving our two lovebirds some time alone together. Rina and Keiichi are OTP for this season, right? I haven't watched many of their shows yet, but these two are definitely the cutest. How can anyone else compare? They head to the river and Reina explains that next is the actual cotton drifting of the festival. Each person takes a wad of cotton, taps their head twice, then their neck or top of their chest twice, then their stomach twice, while giving thanks to Oyashiro-sama, the guardian deity of Hinamizawa. They then let their wads of cotton drift down the river. It's a very important ritual, Reina says, and it's essential that everyone is respectful. She repeats, Thank you, Oyashiro-sama. Thank you, Oyashiro-sama, with a look of reverence on her face. It seems like she takes this tradition very seriously, surprising for someone that transferred to the town just a year or two prior. After enjoying the sights of all the pieces of cotton flowing down the river, Reina and Keiichi decide to go find Mion and Sadako and Rika, because apparently they are completely clueless as to why Mion bolted after Rika's dance. So much for alone time. Reina offers to go find them by herself, waving off Keiichi, so he just strolls alongside the river, until he comes across Tomitake, who he starts to call out to before noticing someone with him, the blonde woman we saw at the end of episode 2. Keiichi decides not to interrupt the apparent lovers, at least he can tell what love is when it comes to other people, and walks away. Unbeknownst to Keiichi, Reina is watching him, that same distant and hurt look on her face that she's shown previously. Why is she there? Was she spying on Keiichi? Did she find the others and was going to let him know where they were? Are her feelings hurt by something Keiichi did or didn't do? There are too many things to consider, but it's certain. Something's going on with her. At school the next day, Keiichi is told that he has a visitor outside. We get a brief glimpse of Chie-sensei, the teacher in charge of Keiichi's class. This is our first look at her, and it only lasts a second. Let's hope we see a lot more of her in the near future. The visitor is a detective from the Okonomiya Police Department, Oishi. Okonomiya is a city near Hinamizawa. Presumably, Hinamizawa is too small to have its own police department, so if there's a crime, police from Okonomiya will come to investigate. Oishi asks Keiichi if he knows Tomitake, and after affirming that he does, Oishi asks if he knows someone else, the blonde woman that was talking to Tomitake at the festival, referred to as Takano, seen in a nurse's uniform in Oishi's photo. After saying that he saw them together at the end of the festival, Oishi asks if there was anything strange about them, or anything worth mentioning. Keiichi asks if something happened to them, and instead of answering, Oishi asks if Keiichi believes in curses. Getting angry, Keiichi asserts that he, of course, doesn't, and Oishi explains that a lot of people in Hinamizawa do, especially Oyashiro-sama's curse. It started four years earlier, 
when the construction manager of the dam project was murdered. This is the case Keiichi read about in the magazine he found at the dump. Six workers killed and dismembered the manager, and five were caught, but the main suspect was never found. The next year, a man that had supported the dam project drowned while on vacation, while his wife went missing. It was assumed that she had drowned with him, but her body was never found. The year after that, the priest at the shrine died from a sudden illness, and his wife drowned herself in a bog. And the year after that, a woman in the town was beaten to death. These incidents, Hoishi says, all happened on the day of the Watanagashi, or cotton drifting, festival, year after year. Each year, someone died on the same day. And so, the residents of Hinamizawa believe that, every year, someone will die on the day of the festival. And Tomitake and Takano, the pair Keiichi saw talking at the end of the night, have been missing since then. Takano's car is still in the parking lot for the festival, and Tomitake's bicycle is still there too. Which gets us to why this detective is talking to Keiichi. Because the villagers believe so strongly in Oyashiro-sama, and believe that the missing pair are simply casualties of Oyashiro-sama's curse, he doesn't expect to get any information out of them. But Keiichi, having previously lived in a big city, doesn't believe in curses, and as a newer resident of Hinamizawa, is more likely to offer something that could help the investigation. Oishi gives Keiichi his phone number and tells him to call if he sees or hears anything suspicious or strange. He also tells Keiichi not to tell anyone that they spoke, especially not his friends, Mion in particular. Very upset, Keiichi asks why, if Oishi thinks that they're involved, but Oishi calmly denies that. He just doesn't want rumors to spread, and doesn't want to rile up anybody that does believe in Oyashio Sama's curse. With that, he leaves, and Keiichi watches his car as he goes. The encounter is very strange. Oishi very much acts like a detective, or at least one in a TV show, albeit a very secretive one. He insists that he and Keiichi talk in his car, using the air conditioning as an excuse so that no one can eavesdrop on their conversation. He also doesn't divulge information until he has to, including his name, which he only tells Keiichi right before he leaves. At the same time, he gives Keiichi a lot of info that doesn't necessarily seem pertinent. Why should it matter that the people of Hinamizawa believe in Oyashiro Sama's curse? If Keiichi knows or learns anything, couldn't he have shared it with Oishi without knowing about a curse? Also, Oishi's behavior makes it seem like he's trying to turn Keiichi against his friends, especially when he tells Keiichi specifically not to tell them about his visit. Why? Does he think that the entire town is in on it, that they all work together to kill people, or even sacrifice people every year on the day of the cotton drifting festival? Is Oishi paranoid and barking up the wrong tree, or does he know more than we can imagine? Heading back inside, Keiichi finds the gang playing their own version of Clue, with Reina being the loser. Ruka asks if Keiichi got in trouble, since they believe he just had to go to the teacher's office, and gives him a pat on the head, just like with Tomitake. Damn, what do I have to do to get head pats from Rika? Since he missed out on the game, Keiichi gets the penalty game along with Reina, which consists of just running errands for Mion. Keiichi and Reina forced to do something together? Okay, you can think I'm wrong, but I am 100% certain that Mion is actively trying to get those two together. I think she rigged the game so that Reina would lose, because she already knew that they'd make Keiichi the loser since he missed the game. Mion would send the two off to spend some time alone together, because they are the greatest pair. It's a fact. We also learn club rule number 7. You must accept the penalty, no matter what. They may just be playing games, but this group is really teaching each other some great lessons. Life doesn't care about how hard you try, and it's not going to give you fewer troubles just because you think things are unfair. That night, Keiichi is unable to sleep, thinking about everything Oishi told him, so he stays up late, reading the magazine about the murdered dam worker. The next day at school, he's tired during lunch and takes a nap, or pretends to and overhears Mion and Reina talking about Tomitake and Takano being missing, an Oyashiro-sama's curse. He hears Mion say that the pair might have been demoned away. 
Gigi runs into Oishi on the way home, who takes him to a restaurant called Angel Mart, where the waitresses wear special uniforms. Gigi asks Oishi about the phrase he heard, and Oishi explains that it's something said in the area. Similar to spirited away, or taken by ghosts, it means obviously to be taken by demons, or specifically oni, or ogres, man-eating monsters from folklore and myth. In the far past, Oishi says, Hinamizawa was feared because it was believed that man-eating demons lived there. So, the idea of killer monsters in Hinamizawa is not new, it seems. Oishi then clues Keiichi in on the other half of Oyashio Sama's curse. Every year, someone is murdered, and another person disappears, or is demoned away. The first year, the dam worker was killed, and the main suspect went missing. The next year, the man that supported the dam project died, and his wife disappeared. The third year, the shrine priest died, and his wife, though she left a suicide note, went missing, with her body never found. And finally, the previous year, a woman was beaten to death and they caught the killer, but a child in that person's care went missing. Four years in a row, the same thing happened on the same day. Sure seems like a curse to me. Keiichi wonders why Reina and Mion didn't tell him, even lying to him to hide the truth. And Oishi says that maybe they didn't want to worry him, or even scare him. After all, if the curse strikes every year, who knows who its victims could be? Why scare Keiichi and make him worry that he could be a victim when they could leave him clueless? I mean, it's not like knowing about it beforehand would help him any, right? So, maybe they were right to hide it? Keiichi confronts Reina about it after school one day, asking her why they've hidden stuff from him. But she turns it around and asks him why he's been hiding stuff from them. He denies it, but she says that she knew that he hid something from the dump from her, the magazine, and that he was actually talking to an older man in a car at the school, the conversation with Oishi. She asks what they were talking about, and he says nothing that has to do with any of them, and Reina explodes. You're lying, she shouts. She says that she's worked hard to be happy, that some people have to work really hard, then says that he has things he wants to hide, and so does she. Satisfied, she walks on and tells him to hurry up. Unnerving. That's the only way to put that encounter. Reina gets right up in Keiichi's face, her eyes look weird, her face looks weird. Everything sends off huge alarms. Something is definitely wrong with her. At home, Keiichi gets a call from Oishi, pretending to be a bookstore so as to fool Keiichi's parents. Because that seems like something a detective would do, right? He tells Keiichi that he's learned some things about Reina. Before moving to Hinamizawa, she was suspended from her old school for going around and breaking all of the windows. She was diagnosed with dysautonomia, prescribed medication, and went through counseling. I'll note here that dysautonomia refers to a group of conditions caused by problems with one's autonomic nervous system. Symptoms can include balance problems, problems with body temperature, nausea, swings in heart rate and blood pressure, and yes, mood swings. But dysautonomia does not seem to have anything to do with having a nervous breakdown or psychological problems, so it's kind of weird for Oishi to mention it. And doesn't that violate Reina's privacy too? Like, in a major way? In Reina's counseling sessions, she apparently kept bringing up Oyashiro-sama, a spirit that visited her every night, standing next to her pillow and watching her. And she apparently knew about Oyashiro-sama because she had previously lived in Hinamizawa, moving away after elementary school. So, not a transfer student after all. Interrupted by his dad, Kichi hangs up with Oishi, only to see his father holding a tray with tea and snacks. Confused, Kichi asks what he's doing, but his father says not to be coy. Reina chan's here, isn't she? He says. While on the phone with Oishi, Reina came by Kichi's house. His father sent her upstairs, but she's not there now. Kichi concludes that Reina stopped outside the door and listened as he talked to Oishi. Leaving after he learned about her destructive and disturbing past. She watched him through a crack in the door. 
And that is episode three. Wow, a lot to take in. And the chills are increasing at a very quick pace. What will Raina do now that Keiichi knows her secrets? And what do those secrets mean? Was Oyashiro-sama actually visiting her? Calling her back to Hinamizawa? And what is Oyashiro-sama's curse? Is it a string of unlikely coincidences? A fiendish plot by the village? Or is there actually a god that is wreaking vengeance on those that threaten the town? If it's the latter, then how did Tomitake threaten the town? And what did Takano, the mysterious blonde woman, have to do with anything? And are those two dead? Will they or their bodies turn up later? Will there be more victims? Just what the hell is going on here? We'll have to wait until episode 4 for more answers. Or maybe we'll just get more questions. Who knows? Either way, life is always fun in Hinamizawa. If you like this video, please give it a like and share it with somebody you think might like it too. Feel free to share thoughts in the comments, just avoid spoilers for things that might happen according to previous Higurashi entries. And if you want to see more videos like this one, subscribe! I'll be doing this week by week for as long as I can. Find me on Twitter at ShaggyJeebus, and remember, friends don't listen to detectives divulge highly personal health info about other friends. That is bad karma.